Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Verse 6 and then verses 18 through 20. This morning we want to look at the proclaiming of the gospel. We're going to find out how the angels were first. The women were second. And the disciples was the last to begin proclaiming the risen Savior. Verse 6, He is not here, for He is risen as He said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And then verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, the disciples, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever to manage you. And lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. We have just came through Holy Week. Palm Sunday, right throughout Holy Monday, Holy Tuesday, Holy Wednesday, Holy Thursday, Holy Friday, Passover, and now we're here, Resurrection Sunday. We had a great time this week worshiping with Haverson Methodist Church in uh, Fairhaven Methodist Church as we came together as a community to celebrate Holy Week. Amen? And boy, can those ladies cook. They had some good soup and some good sandwiches and cookies. Amen? So not only did we get blessed spiritually, we got blessed physically. We're so thankful for our visitors this morning. Uh, make a trip all the way to New York, come down here and be in our little country church. We're so glad to have y'all you got to remember, today you're a visitor. Next time you come, you're family. Amen? We don't have visitors long. We make them family right away. Amen? So, as we look at this morning, we've already witnessed the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. We've heard them call Him Hosanna. We saw where Jesus went and cleansed the temple and announced that His house was to be called the house of prayer not a place for thieves. We have witnessed the betrayal of Jesus, the institution of the Lord's Supper, His arrest and mock trial, His appearance before Pilate, His crucifixion, and His body placed in the tomb. Which brings us today to Resurrection Sunday, where we celebrate our Lord rising from the dead. He is not dead. He is alive. And because Jesus lives, we now live through Him. I want to tell you there's no better life on this earth than to live as a Christian in Jesus Christ. Amen. To know that you have a God big enough to take care of any dictator, take care of any military, and above all, take care of His people. Amen? Amen. I'm glad that our God supplies all of our needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus our Lord. Learn this truth this morning. The grave is empty. Death has been defeated. Christ has risen from the dead. Satan has been given a death blow. And we are just about justified by faith in Christ's finished work on the cross. Amen? Aren't you glad that the manger is empty? Amen? Aren't you glad that the cross is empty? Amen? But we rejoice more because the tomb is empty. Because Christ rising from the dead put approval on everything we believe. Paul said, if Jesus be not risen from the dead, then our faith is in vain. It's useless. But now is Christ risen from the dead. Amen. We are walking in truth because He who was truth and is truth arose from the dead, fulfilling His truth. First we find out that the angels proclaim the good news. The ladies have already gone out and bought perfumes. They want to anoint the body of our Lord because He was taken hastily from the cross and put in the tomb before He was anointed for His burial. Because they were trying not 
to cause the Sabbath to be desecrated. So they got him in the tomb very quickly, wrapped in his clothes and a napkin on his face. The priest, of course, they think that possibly because Jesus said he had risen from the dead, the best thing they could do was put a big stone in front of him. Put soldiers out in front of him. Stick a centurion out there. Because they did not want the disciples to come and steal the body and say that Jesus was risen from the dead. Folks, you got to remember that wasn't a little stone. And before the disciples could get into the, into the tomb where he would be at, they would have to kill all them Russian, uh, those Roman soldiers. Amen? And besides that, they were cowering in their homes. They had gone and hidden themselves because they didn't want to die just yet. One out of all the disciples followed him all the way to the cross. John. John the Beloved. Followed him into the judgment hall. Went with him up Calvary's mountain. Stood with him at the cross till he died. Then it was Peter and John who went to look into the tomb when the disciples came. So let's look at this. The first day of the week, the women are going to the tomb to anoint the body of Christ. Suddenly there was an earthquake and the angel of the Lord was sent to roll the stone away. This is going to be interesting. Remember that the stone was not placed to keep Jesus in the tomb. According to the priest, the disciples were going to come and steal his body and say Jesus had risen from the dead. But what the priest didn't know was the disciples were not to be found. What they also didn't know was the power of God to raise the dead. Amen. Well, they had a religion. They truly did. And they had witnessed throughout their history the power of God that delivered them from their enemies and delivered them out of Egypt into the promised land. They witnessed all of that. But somewhere along the way, that belief got a little cold. And folks, the further you get yourself from the cross, if you're not careful, the colder your experience will be. We need to refresh ourselves in how and what God's done for us. We need to keep the fire going. I know coming up as a boy, one of our chores was to go and get the mule and hook him to a sleigh, go down the woods and saw a tree down and hack it up, put it on the sleigh and bring it back to the house. I have to find a fat lighter log. Who knows what a fat lighter log is? All right, okay. Some of us are old enough to do that. Yeah. To have a something to start the fire with. And we knew that if we let the fire go out, there was another fire that was going to happen. And we wouldn't be able to sit down for a while. <laughs> it is the same way with your Christian experience. You have to keep your experience in Christ fueled with the Word of God. You have to keep it fueled in prayer and in touch with God. And you have to keep it fueled by believing God for more and more and more and more. The more you believe God to do, particularly as it applies to the impossible, the greater your faith is. And the greater you can believe. Amen. If I had listened to the doctors 14 years ago, I'd be dead as a doornail. Amen. Cancer is supposed to take me out. But I'm still here. Amen. Six heart attacks couldn't take me out. Two strokes couldn't take me out. Amen. Because I got an all-powerful God. Amen. And I want to tell you, my God has never left me nor forsook me. In the darkest time, my God has been there. And in the joyous times, my God has been there. Amen? Amen. He said to the disciples, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end. 
Amen. Can you believe that? He's with us forever. Amen. Now, I want to tell you, that scripture, some people take out of context. Though I'm with y'all, that's not telling you not to fly in an airplane because God's only going to be with you low. That's not what that's saying. <laughs> He's saying, behold, I will be with you always. Amen. Even when you're in the airlines. Amen. Okay. I'm so glad that God's got His hand under that thing. Amen. Well, I've seen some of them jumping up and down lately. I'm glad God's got His hand under there. When I get on a plane to go somewhere, I'm praying, Father, I'm not trusting this airline pilot and this co-pilot. I'm trusting the pilot of my soul. Amen. Get me to the place I need to be. Yes. And get me home. Amen. <laughs> and don't let this plane fall because I get real sick. Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. As the women were headed for the tomb, think about this thing. With perfumes to anoint the body of Jesus, they wondered who will roll the stone away. God tells us that we have not because we ask not. And we receive not because we ask amiss, that we might consume it upon our lungs. But notice here, the Bible also teaches us God knows what we have need of before we ask. But He expects us to ask because that's a demonstration of faith. Here these ladies, they weren't praying. They were just not thinking. They had a desire in their heart. Who will roll the stone away? And while they were wondering that, God was ahead of them. God had already sent the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord rolled the stone away. Amen. I want to tell you, God's ahead of you, folks. <laughs> Whether you know it or not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the God of the past, the God of the present, and the God of the future. Amen. God already knows what's coming tomorrow. Amen. He knows what's coming this afternoon. He knows what's ahead of you. Let me tell you what else He knows. He knows His grace is sufficient for you. He knows He has all power in heaven and earth, and He can move mountains for you. Amen. 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 So Amen. what do we have to fear? Now, y'all going to excuse me if I get a little excited, but i got an excited God. Amen. 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 I want to tell you when those old, old Egyptians over yonder tried to come against Israel, thought they were going to whoop them. Six days, and the Lord whooped the tar. Amen. Great battle was going to take place. The Egyptians outnumbered the Jews, the Israelites. More tanks. They were in Gaza. Egyptians, Jews, coming towards each other. And suddenly, the Egyptians turned around, went the other direction. Later on, they caught some of those Egyptian POWs. And they said, hey, y'all had us whooped. What happened? They said, what do you mean, had you whooped? They said, there was 12 giant angels behind you with flaming swords. And we knew we were coming against God. Yes, we went the other way. Listen, if America believed God as strong as the Jews did at that time, we'd never lose a battle. We'd never lose a war. Amen? God will be on our side. Always remember, the nation who forgets God, God will forget. Amen? God demands righteousness in His nation. God demands holiness in His nation. And my prayer this morning when we were out at the uh, sunrise service was God send revival to America. We need revival. And it started, folks. If you've listened to the news recently, those young people out in those colleges, God's Spirit was moving among them. Young people crying, getting down the altar and getting their life turned around. And then turn around and go telling somebody else about the gospel. Yes. Amen. That's true revival, folks. Did you know that? Yes. Revival is more than the crying and the emotion. Thank God that we can get emotional. But revival says, I believe what I heard. Now, I'm going to go tell somebody. I'm going to let them know the joy and the peace that I have. That's revival. We learn in John reading his book, when Peter and John came to the tomb, that there was the grave clothes and a folded napkin. 
Now let me tell you what that means. In the Jewish culture, when they had lunch, dinner, whatever, the servants knew that when they went to the master's plate, if the napkin was wadded up and thrown down, the master was done. He wasn't coming back to the table. They could clear the plate. But if they got to the table and the napkin was folded, the master was coming again. God left a message to his disciples. Folks, I'm risen from the dead, but I'm coming again. <laughs> Amen. I'm coming again. And we live in a day and time. We could see that. Amen. We live in a day and time. There could be the rapture of the church. There could be a change in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. But if not, we're going to be faithful till He comes. Because He said He's coming again. The women came to the tomb. Then an angel was there. And I want to tell you folks, the Bible says that those centurions, those guards, they, they fell down like dead men. And if you saw an angel today, you might do the same thing. <laughs> How many have seen an angel lately? How many have looked to see an angel lately? I'm not talking about wise men. Because <laughs> we know they're angels all the time. <laughs> Most of the time, anyway. Uh, the Bible says, be careful to entertain strangers because you entertain angels unaware. Amen? Mm -hmm. yes, you may have entertained a stranger mm -hmm. and at the same time been entertaining an, an angel. Mm -hmm. You know why you didn't see the angel? You weren't looking for him. Mm -hmm. Amen? You see, if God could pull back the veil and let us see in this house, there's angels in this house. Mm -hmm. The angelic host. When people of God gather together in God's name, His angelic host comes along. Amen. They're worshiping in heaven, but they're also worshiping with us right here. Amen. I'm not asking God to pull the veil back because I don't want a bunch of churches full of dead people. Amen. <laughs> Scare us to death, wouldn't it? What if our Lord in His glorified body suddenly manifested Himself among us? We can't handle it. That's why we're going to have a glorified body. That's so that this old flesh, this old blood's going to be gone, back to dust. Amen? But then God's going to change this old mortal body into immortality, this old corruptible into incorruptible, and give us a body we can stand in the presence of God. Amen? Amen. And then we won't quit at the angels. Because quite honestly, and I say this very reverently, we're going to be a step above the angels. Amen? We're going to be a step above the angels. Because we were created in God's image. We were created to worship Him. Now, as we see the angels said, when they saw it, He says, He's not here. He's risen. Go and tell His disciples. You know, these, that, that's a good job being an angel. Because they get all the good stuff. They get to shout from heaven, there's a baby born in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem of Judea. Amen. Now they come to shout the greatest message ever heard. He's not here. He's risen. And now you go. But who did he say it to? The second people who begin to proclaim the gospel, the great gospel, is women. Women. You see, God had women's liberation going long before anything started over here. You see, when Eve fell in the garden, sad to say, before the garden incident, she was on an equal plane with Adam. She was his helpmate. They were supposed to take care of the garden. But when she fell, and then let's face it, can't blame the woman. Got to blame Adam. You see, Adam got the word firsthand. God spoke directly to Adam. Adam told Eve. Notice the Bible says that Adam fell in the transgression. Amen. Wasn't the woman. She was deceived. But it was Adam who fell in the transgression. It was Adam that the covenant was made with. It was Adam whom God was wanting to represent the entire human race. Adam failed God. 
But from that point, women took a subjugated position. In that culture, most of the time the women had to walk behind the man. They were considered less than property. They were supposed to bear children, supposed to take care of the house. But for some reason, man lowered that which God made equal with man. But notice here what God does. God sends an angel and he says to the women, you go. He says, I'm fixing to elevate you up in the culture and in the church. You are to be respected in the culture and the church. Your ministry is to be respected in the culture and in the church. God elevated women to a place that they are to be respected and taken care of. Amen? I don't know, ladies. That's a shouting thing to me. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Amen? To know that God took and raised you up and gave you an important message to take to His disciples. Go and tell my disciples, the angel says, that He's risen. And I'm going before them into Galilee. And the ladies went to tell the disciples. But here's the problem. When the disciples heard it, they thought it was idle tales. Why? Because it was coming from a woman. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? That just because a woman brought the message from God, they called it an idol tale. But then something got a hold of it. The word finally sunk in for curiosity. And Peter and John run to the tomb. And guess what they found when they got there? An empty tomb. Amen. He first said to the angels, Go and proclaim He's risen. Then entrust that good news to women so that they can go and tell the disciples that He is risen. Amen. Then He says to the disciples, See that rank that God's just put here? Now I'll go tell the disciples that I go before them in Galilee. Folks, we have got to, in our culture, respect the roles that God has put among us. The role of a man and the role of a woman. And they are to be respected. Amen? We're supposed to respect men the way God respects men, and we are supposed to respect women the way God respects women. Now I want to tell you, God kept trying to tell men throughout the Old Testament. He had old Ruth, used her, had Esther, that you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. He used Deborah, the judge. So throughout, he is Old Testament, God was saying, y'all guys are looking at this wrong. You're looking at women different than what I told you to look at them. And he says, here they are. I've even put one of them up as a judge over Israel. Mm -hmm. Ladies, be excited. God respects you. <laughs> God's holy word respects you. And if any man doesn't want to respect you, then say, forget you. Amen. Because I'm respected by a higher power. Amen. I'm respected by the almighty God. Amen. Finally this morning, the disciples and believers from all generations are commissioned to go and take. The disciples obeyed. They departed Jerusalem. They went to Galilee. When they saw the Lord, of course, He's a risen Lord. They worshipped Him as they should have. Then Jesus gives the Great Commission. Verse 18, And Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power or authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. And <laughs> Jesus said, 
I have all the authority. You go. <laughs> Don't sit around the church and wait for me to do all the work. You go. Amen? You go. He says to every man, woman, boy, and girl in the church, we are supposed to be witnesses for Christ and we are to go under the authority and the power of Almighty God. When Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth belongs to me, he's saying, all right, that's my authority, <coughs> but you're my ambassadors. And as my ambassadors, you go with my authority. You go with my power. You go with my name. When you look at our, at our ambassadors around the world, when they're there, they are representing America. They're representing the power of the presidency. They're representing the power of the Congress. They're representing the power of the justice system. And they're representing the power of the military because they are speaking in the name of America. When you go forth in Jesus' name, you are going forth under His authority, His power, His resources to do the work of God. Don't be afraid. I remember the first time the Lord got under my skin and said, you know, you got to go. <coughs> and I wasn't a preacher then. I was just sitting in a pew. I said, okay, Lord. Where do I go? House to house. Okay, Lord. So I got to a place, and I don't know about you, but when you first go to witness, you got knees that knock together. Or at least I did. I was scared. I got out, I said, Lord, please go with me. I can't do this if, if you ain't with me. Please go with me. And I'm saying, he's with me. He's with me. He's with me. Knocked on the door. The guy comes out with a pistol. No revolver. And he said, get away from my door. I said, I can't. God told me I had to come here. God told me I'd talk to you. And he stepped back just a moment. And just about that moment, I was like a pig in a, in a pen. How they can stick a nose in one of those little loops and go right through it. I went right by him. Into his house. He sat on one side of the coffee table. I sat on the other side of the coffee table. I said, God told me to come by here today. He says, do you know when you were on the door, knocked on the door, I was con contemplating suicide. That's why I had this pistol. I was going to take my life. Then I realized why God put me. And he, and he laid the gun, thank God. He laid the gun down on the coffee table. And I began to tell him about Jesus. He said, Jesus don't want you to kill yourself. Jesus wants you to live. Jesus wants you to know that He is your Savior. And no matter what is going on in your life, that you feel so bad that it's not worth living anymore and you want to take your life. Jesus has something for you. Wrong man. And men, men aren't good at crying. They don't like to cry because they make think it feels them like they're a little bit not strong. But this wrong big old man, almost as big as Chris back there, didn't cry. Shake. I knew when I seen that, God's conviction was all over him. When you, when you witness enough, you know when people start crying and shaking, the Spirit's on them. God has convinced them about what you just said. I said, do you want to pray with me? I don't know how to pray. I said, I tell you what, I'll pray with you. You pray what I pray. And if you believe what we're praying when we're done, God will answer the prayer and Christ will be in your heart. You'll be saved and you won't want to kill yourself. And we began to pray. The more we prayed, the more he cried. Amen. The more he shook. But suddenly, when we got to the end of the prayer, he looked up at me. He had changed from a man with a dark face. All was crunched up with whatever was happening. And suddenly there was a glow of God upon his face. There was a brightness of the Lord upon him. Amen. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Amen. He said, you know what? Life's worth living. 
Amen. Amen. Listen. If we go like God says, He'll take our enemies and make them our friends. Amen? When we obey God, God does miraculous things. Amen? So this man is changed. When these men began to say, they said, go. Go what? Go and teach all nations. That phrase, teach all nations, is translated, make disciples of all nations. Not just get them born again. Stick with them till they're disciples. You know, you don't birth a baby and then throw it to the world. You raise that baby, and it's the same way when somebody's born again. You don't let them go their merry little way. You get them into the church, and you put your arms around them, and you're there when they have death in their family, or they have some bad thing happens in their life, or they celebrate. But you're there, and you let them know that they're loved. Amen. And by and by, you'll find out that that person is suddenly doing something for Jesus. They're suddenly out making disciples. And the church grows. Amen. We are God's instruments of seeing the world saved. You want to hurry the Lord's coming? Let's get out there and get the world saved. Amen. Amen. Let's take a lot of folks with us. Then notice what he says. Baptizing him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. He says that they have to be baptized. In other words, they have to associate with Jesus. That's what baptism was all about. When they came to John and they said, Whose baptism do you have? They said, We're